This is a true crime in real time update from True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast. I'm Tony Bruski. Let me ask you this. How do you explain someone's behavior when everything they do, everything they say, seems more like the thinking of a child than that of a grown adult? Is it innocence? Naivety? Or is it something much darker? An immaturity that masks the capacity for real cruelty? That's exactly what we're trying to understand today as we dig into the story of Sarah Boone. A woman accused of zipping her boyfriend, Jorge Torres Jr., into a suitcase after a night of drinking. Sarah says it was all a game, hide-and-seek gone wrong. She says she simply fell asleep. But here's the thing. While Torres was still trapped inside, Boone was recording videos on her phone. Videos where she's laughing, taunting him, and ignoring his desperate cries for air. What kind of mindset leads to a decision like that? And perhaps more importantly, what comes after? You might expect remorse, regret, some kind of understanding of the gravity of the situation. Instead, Sarah's focus in court has been snacks. That's right, candy, chips, and juice pouches. She even asked the judge if someone from the court could bring her cookies. It makes you wonder how much of Sarah's behavior is tied to trauma, or is it something deeper? Emotional regression? Is she thinking like a child trapped in the body of an adult? Or is this all just an elaborate performance, an attempt to minimize her actions? This is where things get complicated. And that's why this case has everyone scratching their heads. On top of it all, her defense team plans to argue that Boone is a victim herself, someone trapped in a cycle of domestic abuse, suggesting that this alleged murder was, in part, a desperate act of self-defense. But are these claims enough to excuse what the videos reveal? And what about Sarah's repeated strange behavior in the courtroom, like rejecting a plea deal and asking for professional hair and makeup? Does she genuinely believe none of this is as serious as it seems? Or is this all part of the same pattern that led to the fatal night in Winter Park, Florida? Stick with me as we peel back the layers on this bizarre and tragic case. A story that blurs the lines between innocence and intent, between childish thinking and adult responsibility. Sarah Boone's story is riddled with complexities, both legal and personal, that make it more than just another tragic headline. Boone, now 46 years old, faces second-degree murder charges in the death of her boyfriend, 42-year-old, Jorge Torres Jr., a man with whom she shared a deeply troubled relationship. On February 24, 2020, police arrived at Boone's residence in Winter Park, Florida, to a scene that seemed more surreal than tragic. A man zipped into a suitcase, unresponsive. Torres was pronounced dead at the scene, and soon after, Boone was arrested. Boone's version of events? She claimed that she and Torres had been drinking heavily that night, eventually deciding to play a game of hide-and-seek. She told police that it was Torres' idea to climb into the suitcase, and after she zipped him in, she went upstairs, laid down, and fell asleep. When she woke up the next morning, she said she found Torres still inside the suitcase. Only now, he wasn't moving. In Boone's original statement to police, she maintained that Torres' death was a tragic accident. She insisted that she never intended to harm him, claiming that their playful relationship sometimes involved unusual games and behaviors. But soon, videos surfaced from Boone's phone, showing a different side of the story. The recordings revealed Torres inside the suitcase, repeatedly calling out Boone's name and pleading, I can't breathe. Boone, in response, could be heard taunting him, saying, this is what it feels like for everything you've done to me. The recordings not only undermined Boone's initial claims of a harmless game gone wrong, They became the central evidence that would shift the narrative from tragic accident to potential murder. Investigators noted that the tone in Boone's voice during the videos was mocking, with no indication that she planned to release Torres from the suitcase anytime soon. The videos now key evidence in the case have raised unsettling questions about Boone's intent. Boone's defense, however, is expected to argue that Torres' death was unintentional and that Boone's behavior in the videos was the result of intoxication. 
combined with frustration stemming from years of emotional and physical conflict between the two. Their relationship, according to police records, was marred by multiple instances of domestic violence. Boone herself had previously been arrested on a charge of battery by strangulation in 2018. Torres had also been arrested three times for domestic violence against Boone in 2019. Each time, the charges were either dropped or resolved without conviction. This history of mutual violence is likely to play a major role in Boone's defense strategy. Her current attorney, James Owens, her ninth since her arrest, has indicated that he will argue Boone suffered from battered spouse syndrome, an attempt to cast the incident as an act of self-defense during a moment of intoxicated confusion. Adding to the bizarre nature of this case is Boone's courtroom behavior. During pre-trial hearings, Boone has made a series of unusual requests, such as asking the judge if she could bring snacks, including chips, candy, and cookies, into court. She also requested permission for professional hair and makeup services to be provided before her appearances. These requests have drawn significant public attention, raising further questions about Boone's grasp on the seriousness of the charges against her. Does she genuinely not understand the weight of what is happening? Or is this behavior part of a broader pattern, one that could complicate the court's ability to assess her state of mind on the night Torres died? Boone's defense attorney has pushed to delay the trial, citing both the need to build an argument for battered spouse syndrome and the challenges posed by Hurricane Milton, which temporarily postponed the original trial date in October 2024. Boone has rejected a plea deal from prosecutors, which would have reduced her sentence to 15 years in exchange for a guilty plea to manslaughter. Now she faces a minimum of 22 and a half years if found guilty, with the potential for a life sentence. Her behavior since the incident has been nothing short of perplexing. Boone has gone through a revolving door of attorneys, with many citing irreconcilable differences as their reason for withdrawing from the case. For a time, Boone even represented herself, penning handwritten letters to the court, expressing grievances about her former attorneys and the legal process. In one letter to the presiding judge, she described herself as blindsided by the withdrawal of a previous attorney and expressed frustration over what she saw as a betrayal by the legal system. The buildup to Boone's trial has not only been delayed by legal wrangling, but has also been marked by strange developments. For instance, one of Boone's letters included a handmade flyer in search of a new attorney, a detail that adds yet another layer to an already complicated portrait of the defendant. As of now, Boone has resolved to take her case to trial, firmly believing that she can convince a jury of her innocence. This case leaves us with a troubling question. Is Sarah Boone someone who genuinely lacks the mental maturity to understand the gravity of her actions? Her childlike requests in court and baffling explanations about the events of that fateful night suggest a mind either overwhelmed by trauma or trapped in a pattern of behavior that refuses to conform to adult expectations. Yet, even if Boone's actions were not driven by malicious intent, the evidence paints a grim picture, one where a man begged for his life, and the only response was laughter. As Sarah Boone's trial prepares to begin, more details emerge, shining a light on the complicated nature of her defense and the mounting challenges she faces in proving her innocence. The 46-year-old defendant stands charged with second-degree murder following her alleged role in the death of her boyfriend, Jorge Torres Jr. Boone continues to maintain that Torres's death was a tragic accident, but the prosecution insists that the phone videos tell a different story, one of deliberate indifference even malice. Jury selection took longer than expected as Boone's behavior and the unusual circumstances of the case have drawn widespread media attention, complicating efforts to find unbiased jurors. Boone's courtroom demeanor hasn't helped. In pretrial hearings, she's made odd childlike requests, including asking for snacks like chips and candy to get through the long days in court, She's also requested professional hair and makeup services, gestures that further distance her from the seriousness of the charges she faces. Observers and legal analysts have speculated that Boone's inability to grasp the weight of the situation may reflect a deeper psychological disconnect. Prosecutors argue that the events leading to Torres' death reflect a disturbing disregard for human life. They point to the phone videos Boone recorded in which Torres repeatedly calls out for her help 
from within the zipped suitcase saying, I can't breathe. In response, Boone can be heard laughing and mocking him, saying, that's my name. Don't wear it out. This callousness is at the heart of the prosecution's case, which frames Boone's behavior as more than negligent. It borders on cruelty. Boone's defense attorney, James Owens, plans to argue that Boone was a victim of domestic violence, pointing to a tumultuous relationship history filled with documented incidents of abuse. Owens has indicated that Boone will plead battered spouse syndrome, a defense strategy aimed at framing the incident as an unintentional act fueled by years of trauma. If the jury believes this argument, it could reduce the severity of the charges or even lead to acquittal. Boone and Torres's history together was undeniably fraught with violence. Police records show that both were arrested multiple times for domestic incidents involving each other. In 2018, Boone was arrested for battery by strangulation, and Torres was arrested on several occasions in 2019 for assaulting Boone. Each time, the charges were either dropped or resolved, underscoring the volatile nature of their relationship. The defense will likely argue that Boone's actions on the night of Torres' death were shaped by years of emotional turmoil and fear. But Boone's past behavior may work against her. In the months following her arrest, Boone cycled through nine different attorneys, with many citing irreconcilable differences as the reason for their withdrawal. At one point, Boone even attempted to represent herself in court, sending handwritten letters to judges and detailing her grievances about previous lawyers. In one letter, Boone claimed that she had been blindsided by an attorney's sudden withdrawal, portraying herself as both victimized by the legal system and misunderstood by those around her. These actions paint a picture of a defendant who is not only unpredictable, but also unwilling to cooperate fully with her legal team, an impression that could sway the jury. Boone's rejection of a plea deal adds another layer of complexity. Prosecutors had offered her a 15-year sentence for a guilty plea to manslaughter, which Boone declined. If convicted of second-degree murder, she faces a minimum of 22 and a half years in prison, with the possibility of a life sentence. By rejecting the deal, Boone has placed her fate entirely in the hands of the jury, believing that they will see the events as an accident rather than an intentional act. Adding to the drama is the fact that this trial has been delayed multiple times, the latest postponement due to Hurricane Milton. Boone's defense team sought an additional delay, but the judge insisted that the trial proceed as scheduled. Boone's legal strategy hinges on establishing reasonable doubt, convincing the jury that she did not intend to harm Torres and that his death was a tragic accident brought on by alcohol and emotional confusion, but the prosecution is ready to counter with the chilling evidence captured on Boone's phone. The moments where Torres begged for his life and Boone did nothing. As the trial begins, the courtroom will become a stage for two competing narratives— one of intentional cruelty and one of tragic misunderstanding. Boone's behavior in court, her requests for snacks, her frustration with her lawyers, and her apparent detachment from the gravity of the charges raises questions about her mental state. Is Boone simply overwhelmed by the legal process, or does her behavior reflect a deeper immaturity, a childish inability to comprehend the consequences of her actions? What happens next will depend largely on how the jury interprets Boone's intent on that fateful night. Did she truly believe Torres would be fine in the suitcase, as she claims? Or was this a deliberate act of revenge fueled by anger and resentment over years of conflict? The answer to these questions will determine whether Boone walks free or spends decades behind bars. Now all eyes are on the courtroom, where Boone's defense team will try to convince a jury that what happened that night was nothing more than a drunken mistake. But with the weight of the prosecution's evidence bearing down, the road to freedom will be anything but easy for Sarah Boone. So, here we are, standing at the crossroads of intent and consequence, trying to make sense of Sarah Boone's actions. It's not easy to reconcile what happened in that cramped, airless suitcase with the image of someone who claims she just made a mistake. A mistake that cost a man his life. But how much of this comes down to Boone's grasp on reality, or lack thereof? Let's look at the facts. On the surface, her behavior seems, well, odd. 
asking the judge for candy and snacks, trying to get her hair and makeup done for court, and writing lengthy letters complaining about her lawyers. These are things you might expect from someone detached from the gravity of their situation. It's almost as if Boone isn't living in the real world at all, but instead trapped in a juvenile state of mind. It's not the behavior of a person who fully grasps the life or death stakes of a second-degree murder trial. But that brings us to the big question, does Sarah Boone think like a child? And if she does, how much does that matter when it comes to her guilt? Courts expect adults to behave as adults, yet here we have someone who, at 46 years old, seems to navigate the world with the emotional compass of a much younger person. Maybe that's part of her defense. If her decision-making really was compromised by trauma or emotional immaturity, does that make her less responsible for what happened that night? Or does it make her more dangerous as someone who could act impulsively without understanding the consequences of her actions? We also have to ask, was this really a game gone wrong? Boone's attorney wants us to believe that battered spouse syndrome played a role, that this was the culmination of years of toxic behavior, both inflicted and received. But let's not forget the videos. They're hard to watch. Torres was trapped, pleading for his life. And Boone? She laughed, mocked him. She even threw in that chilling line, That's my name, don't wear it out. It's a haunting moment because it reveals something dark. Maybe not just childishness, but malice. So where does that leave us? Did Boone truly think she was playing a harmless game of hide-and-seek, or was this something far more sinister? If she believed, really believed, that Torres would be fine, was it naivety, neglect, or something much worse? These are the questions the jury will have to wrestle with. And it's not just a matter of what happened that night. It's about why. Why would someone with nine attorneys, multiple arrests, and years of emotional turmoil think that her actions were anything but dangerous? As the trial unfolds, it will be up to the court to decide if Boone's actions were born from trauma and childish thinking or if they crossed the line into something criminally deliberate. But make no mistake, the outcome of this case isn't just about what happens to Sarah Boone. It's about how we as a society understand responsibility, intent, and mental health. Where does immaturity end and accountability begin? That's the uncomfortable space this case occupies, and it leaves us all with a lot to think about. I'm Tony Bruschi, and if you want to stay on top of this story and more, hit subscribe, because this is one case you'll want to follow to the end. There's still a lot to unpack, just like that suitcase. In a world where the darkest secrets lie just beneath the surface. Well, they said it was an accident, but the evidence says otherwise. Where hidden killers roam unnoticed in the shadows. I think you would definitely be looking at a, a blend of toxic, very bad narcissistic personality traits, and they will be vengeful and possibly resort to violence. Join Tony Bruschi as he uncovers the truth behind the most chilling cases. They said it was an accident, but the evidence clearly says otherwise. Each episode, we dig deep into the minds of those who commit the unthinkable. To your point on narcissism, he thinks in his own mind how witty he is, yeah. but he lost that jury. I, I was I was done with him in two minutes. From unsolved mysteries to infamous crimes. Geez, you've just talked about how you've taught yourself how to do everything under the sun. I bet you did a YouTube video, how to best kill somebody with a knife. Hidden Killers with Tony Bruschi takes you where few dare to go. How does someone with such a dark secret go unnoticed? for so long with multiple new episodes every single day we're not just telling stories we're seeking justice listen now on apple podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts just search for hidden killers with tony brewski